Welcome to today's breakfast briefing, whether you are joining us here in person or online. Um, today, we will delve into the latest advancement in te uh, nanotechnology and what this entail for international peace and security. My name is Wen Ting, and I work as an associate researcher for Unidia's Security and Technology Program. Today, I'm very honored to be joined by Professor Adrian Yonescu, who is a full professor of nanoelectronics at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Lausanne, or EPFL. Today's event marks the very first session of, a Unidir techno um, of the Unidia Technology Breakfast Series, which um, aims at exploring key technology domains that are either enabling or driving further development in information and communication technologies, as well as artificial intelligence. So I actually have um, a presentation, so I'm just going to share. Perfect, it's working. So um, the series um, actually builds upon the research insight from our recent publication titled Enabling Technologies and International Security, a Companion 2023 edition, which uh, you can access through the link or the QR code on the screen. This companion is dedicated to identifying and analyzing the most salient advancements in enabling technologies and their impact on international security. So four distinct um, technology categories were covered in um, this publication, including, as you can see on the screen, advanced materials, parts and components, processing and computing power, as well as the relevant connectivity infrastructure, uh, which uh, provides vital support for the ICT ecosystem. In this session, as you know, we will focus on the crucial topic of nanotechnology, which sits within the advanced materials category. Over the coming month, we will explore um, additional technology areas on this list through subsequent breakfast briefings. And for today, the agenda uh, the agenda includes, firstly, an introductory overview of nanotechnology and its latest development, as presented in the Unidir Companion. Following this, I will give the floor to Professor uh, Yonescu for in-depth examination of the technology, particularly focusing on um, his work in the field of nanoelectronics and its implications for international security. We will have a dedicated Q&A session at the end for you to raise any questions directly to Professor Unesco. And please note that the event is being recorded and will be made available on Unidir's YouTube channel. <laughs> However, we will not record the Q&A session at the end to encourage open dialogue. Great, so um, let's start with a bit of explanation of uh, nanotechnology. So this field of studies, which Professor Unesco here knows very well about, uh, contributes to the design, manufacture, and application of uh, materials at the nanoscale, ranging from uh, 1 to 100 nanometers, with 1 nanometer equivalent to 1 billionth of a meter. Mm -hmm. So how small exactly is a nanometer? it might be difficult to visualize. So let's just put that into perspective here. Um, so yeah, a sheet of paper I'm holding um, right here, it's about 100,000 nanometers thick, and your fingernail can grow uh, one nanometer in just about every second. On comparative scale, if the diameter of a marble were one nanometer, then the diameter of the entire Earth would be roughly one meter. So we can see how tiny uh, we are talking about on the nanoscale. And what's so special about nanotechnology? Well, at the nanoscale, unique and often um, novel properties can emerge as a result of quantum mechanical effects and the increased surface area to volume ratio of nano uh, particles compared with microscopic systems. <clears throat> Through manipulating matter on a near atomic level, nanotechnology can be leveraged to change material properties such as electric um, conductivity, melting points, and chemical reactivity, to name just a few. 
So uh, this can enable the creation of new structures, materials, and devices. Well, nano, um, you know, like, well, now technology might seem quite distant from us. It's actually already deeply embedded in our daily lives, as in the case of uh, non, um, mobile devices. Nanotechnology can facilitate the fabrication of increasingly smaller and more efficient electronic components, such as microchips that are empowering our digital life. The development of nanoscale transistors, which are very crucial in the microchip architecture, not only augment memory capacity of our mobile devices over the years, but also enable transformative applications such as AI, 5G and the Internet of Things, and we will delve into this uh, further in just a bit. Evidently, this advancement carry uh, very significant implications for international security, especially regarding potential military uses. In the Unidia Compendium, we have highlighted three prominent fields where nanotechnology can um, potentially play an important role in supporting um, ICT applications and, in some cases, enhancing military capabilities. In advanced sensing um, applications, the incorporation of nanotechnology can create smaller and more sensitive sensors that can detect biological and chemical threat agents. Nanomaterial-based biosensors can outperform um, conventional bio-threat detection methods <laughs> as they can achieve higher sensitivity and accuracy if, even with reduced sample volume, uh, preparation time, and assay costs. Now, technology has been applied in um, environmental monitoring of air and, and water quality, as well as pollutant detection. It can potentially benefit disarmament verification efforts, particularly in the biological and chemical weapon domains. In the computing field, it would be no exaggeration to say that um, now technology is paving the way for next generation computing. As many of you may know, the current silicon technology <clears throat> for microchip is approaching the physical limit. So emerging nanomaterials such as graphene, carbon nanotubes, and quantum dots are presenting opportunities for a new computing paradigm. In recent years, um, carbon nanotubes, they are essentially tubes uh, made of carbon with a diameter in a nanometer range, have been identified by researchers to be a very attractive alternative to replace silicon in the semiconductor manufacturing. And uh, this highly conductive nanomaterial is believed to be capable of surpassing silicon-based transistors, but its advantage in real-world application um, is still yet to be seen. In addition, quantum dots, which are nanoscale crystals synthesized through the process of nanofabrication, are believed to have the revolutionary potential in the field of quantum computing. Due to um, their quantum properties, um, quantum dot can actually be used as qubits, which serve as the building blocks of quantum computers. They can help build uh, scalable, cost-effective, and fault-tolerant working quantum machines. However, despite the promise, the relevant technology is still in its infancy, with several te uh, technical and commercial obstacles to overcome. And lastly, on communications, um, <clears throat> nanotechnology presents multiple benefits, including lower energy um, consumption, miniaturized communication devices, and um, enhanced connectivity, as in the case of 5G. Nanomaterial can also be used to create highly efficient antennas and improve signal efficiency and uh, reliability. For instance, Nanoscale antennas have been developed by uh, researchers to enable light speed data transfer between different core processors with minimized signal loss. And looking ahead, undoubtedly, nanotechnology holds considerable um, potential for enhancing military information and communications systems. Thus, it's um, 
necessary to maintain a close monitoring of any future development and applications. The development and deployment of nanotechnology, however, are not without risks. The most highlighted risks remain to be health and environmental considerations. Current research indicates that um, nano uh, nanoparticles can display a wide range of toxicity and environmental hazards, posing threat to um, both the human health and ecological well-being. More sp uh, specifically on health uh, concerns, the size and composition of nanoparticles allow, allow them to breach the physiological barriers of living organisms. And by doing so, they can cause harmful biological reactions within the human body, such as lung inflammation and cardiac problems. In terms of environmental considerations, nanomaterials produced during manufacturing process may find their way into ecosystems through deliberate or accidental releases, potentially leading to ground and water com contamination. And it's very important to note that um, these risks may not be uh, quite apparent in the field of nanoelectronics or ICT technologies, but they are more like primarily um, associated with the, the biological and chemical domains. So with this in mind, I'm curious to hear from Professor UNESCO on any potential challenges nanotechnology may present in the field of uh, electronics. Thank you so much. And over to you, Professor. I will um, change the presentation. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Yes. Is okay? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Is is a. You might speak a bit closer to Microsoft. Do you want to get this one? Okay. Okay. I can come closer. No problem. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. I am. Um, so again, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here and uh, try to share with you uh, some of the um, insights and um, expertise I have in, in nanotechnology and see how uh, this can have implication on international security. So th there are a number of topics that I would like to address here with you in the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, we already have a good definition by Wenting of nanotechnology before, so I will go faster to that. And, and then these are the topics that I would like to address. Nanomaterials, nanochips, cloud and edge computing, bio nanosensing, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and then have a summary with implication for international uh, um, security. So you have before this discussion about scale, so when we are talking about the scale of nanometer, what we call technology is everything between one and 100 nanometer. And uh, one nanometer is 10 power minus nine meter. Um, there are a few objects here that, that you see uh, on this um, um, view graph. For instance, typically the, the size of a virus is of the order of tens of nanometer, 80 to 100 nanometer. So a vi virus will be very well in this category. And then below the nanometer, some people were reflecting, would we have in the future something that we call not nanotechnology, but picotechnology, right? 10 minus 12. I can tell you this will be very hard because when you go with sub one nanometer, you are in the atomic scale. So we don't know yet how to engineer this scale, right? So we are really close to the physical limit of um, that what technology have, have done. And uh, indeed, what is happening at this scale is that we observe in research lab and then in many applications that key properties of the matter change at nanoscale. It was mentioned before about electrical properties. When we have a metal in very thin layer and we compare, for instance, with the conductivity of a um, 
monolayer of carbon, like in a wall of a carbon nanotube or in graphene, we find that in this nanomaterial, we can beat the conductivity of the best metal, of copper, and we can conduct better electricity, we can conduct better heat. We can have in a nanotube, so tiny nanotube, one wall, atomic wall fin, the stiffness of diamond. So same if you look at use of this uh, material for energy conversion, for sensing, it was mentioned before, these are objects that have a ratio between the surface and volume extremely high, which makes amazing sensor out of it. So for instance, look at some application here. Imagine that in an aircraft, a, a civilian or military, you can change all the wiring with this type of wires that will be much lighter and much more conductive. Imagine that we can deploy in the future in the space a, a solar sail in which we are covering with extremely light material that is having there the, the best absorption or reflection of light. So these are applications that are coming. And it happened, and it's something happening in the history of uh, nanotechnology, that some of the first innovation came in the domain of space, airborne, military. But then the, they are kind of impacting at large our uh, civil application, and I am going to explain you how. So uh, we can make material that we call nano with zero dimension. What does it mean zero dimension? All the three dimension that you can imagine like a fullerene, like in a ball of a uh, carbon 60 are sub nanometer. So this is this are small object like a nanoparticle, right, that can have all the dimension. This is a zero dimensional material. Then you can have one dimensional material like carbon nanotube. What, what you have on the right hand side here, these are carpets. Like a carpet in your room, we can make a carpet of carbon nanotubes, extremely thin, let's say a few atomic layer thin. And you are going to tell me what, what you are doing with this carpet. What I can do with this carpet, we can um, detect part per million or part per billion concentration of gases in hazard detection, for instance. So we can make the most sensitive sensor out of it. Same with, with um, what you see at the bottom right, um, nanowires. So nanowires are one dimensional uh, par, uh, uh, object. So in fact, the diameter is smaller than few nanometer or the order of few nanometer and they have length much bigger. And they can be used to build electronic devices. They can be used for energy conversion. They can be used for many applications. But they are filled, right? It's not like a carbon nanotube that is empty. And, and then, of course, as you know, um, we had in the uh, years 2000, the Nobel Prize uh, in Europe to two physicists that invented the famous graphene, a monolayer of carbon that has amazing properties in being atomic thin, as strong as diamond light conductivity that I mentioned before. And what we can do today, what you see on the left hand side here, is that we can make this material on wafer with the same processes as we make transistor, so we can bring it into real product at, at this moment. And um, beyond um, this dimensionality, there are other materials in which you have structure that at grain level, at nano grain level, can offer fantastic other property. I pick here one example of a phase change material. You see, when we study with students the different properties of material, we say there are three categories, the conductors, the insulator, and in between the semiconductors. And there is something that we call in physics the band gap theory. And this band gap theory is based on the idea that all this conduction, the electron do not interact much among them. They are independent. Well, if you have material in which electron can interact collectively, this will fantastically change their property. So what is this class of material that I call metal insulator transition? These are materials that, for instance, up to a certain temperature, they behave like an insulator. And then from this temperature, at higher temperature, they will switch in a metal state. And this is reversible. So they are not listening to fundamental Band gap theory, and I am showing you here, for instance, on the right hand side up, that if I test with atomic four microscope a single grain of this material, look at the scale there, sub 100 nanometer, it, it has this transition control by just an electrical field. Now, 
what can you do with this thing? You can do, for instance, devices that have this type of behavior that have conductivity modulated. This is exactly what is happening in, in nature with the neurons, right? The neuron have this type of memoristic behavior. You can build meta surfaces, me surfaces that absorb or reflect the signal. You can make also sensor with them. You can make also extremely interesting thing with a material like vanadium oxide, like making a thin layer that will absorb certain wavelength and reflect the other. For instance, I can reflect the infrared so I can cover all the windows of this building so that I am cooling down the building. But I can do other things. I can cover a hot engine of a military vehicle and you will not see it anymore in infrared. Mm -hmm. So there are different applications of this and this vanadium, for instance, dioxide is a, is a rather abundant element on Earth. You find it in the water of ocean. It's still a strategic material. It's abundant, but it's strategic. Why it's strategic? Because you can find it in mineral abundantly only in certain region, strategic region of the earth that I will not cite. Now, so in summary, there are huge benefits from material. In electronics and IT, I will show you immediately a few of them where we can address, it was mentioned before, energy efficiency and high performance. I will show you some application in medical and healthcare domain, how we can do better imaging, diagnostic tool, sequencing technology, nanotherapeutics in energy. In energy, you all need uh, this better conversion and storage. Storage of energy is a big problem today, right? We can produce energy, we cannot, we don't know yet how to store it efficiently. Energy harvesting. And even environmental remediation, like we can check very rapidly low cost the quality of our environment, what is called the exposome, right? We are exposed, we are taking, we have intake, water, um, air, um, food, all this we can now monitor for a certain quality. Of course, there are risks. Uh, in many cases, for many of this material, there are not yet a fully elucid elucidated biological response because many of them are artificial. So the main risk in many cases are related to inhalation. So in some of them, we have to be careful to avoid this when we prepare. Uh, hazard in production in some cases and manipulation. And of course, in some cases, what we do with the nanomaterial waste. And in, in principle, you can address that with what we call precautionary measures. So which means take this measure until you certify the material for safety. And this is a good point. Now, Last day, we have been all confronted with this aurora borealis. We have looked at the skies, and the skies were looking so beautiful. And if you've been on late night and looking at the sky, maybe you have seen the beautiful Milky Way. And as you may know, the Milky Way has somewhere between 200 and 400 billion of stars. Extremely beautiful. So this is a number that is extremely high and impressive. And we may ask ourselves, the humankind has produced any object at this type of scale? And the answer today is yes, we have a single object that is order of magnitudes higher in number than this, and this is the nanotransistor. And I want to give you one example, 200 billion star plus in Milky Way, we have 208 billion transistor in the last NVIDIA Blackwell chips, right? These are the chips that are required by performing AI task, communicating at 10 terabit per second. So the humankind in a single chip produce as many star as the Milky Way as of today. And this is something that in the same time, we can think how to use it at the best for humanity and the other side, it can be a bit uh, worrying. And with which technology has been done? Of course, with nanotechnology. The size of a transistor that we produce today that you see on the top, this is a transistor on the top that looks like, um, we call it a fin fat. The, the fin, right, is what a shark has on this back, the fin of a shark. And, and this is a fin that, if you look at the right hand side, has a thickness of a few nanometer and a height of around 10 nanometer. So you can count the atom. And in a chip, we conduct electricity through this fin. So what you see on top, like the omega gate is the control we put. So we can put in a chip, you'll be 
maybe some of you know, some not, but we can put uh, of the order of 1 billion transistors per 1 millimeter square, all working without error, and we guarantee you that they will work for 10 years. Right? This is the level of technology. So one of these transistors is roughly 10 times smaller than the size of a virus, of a coronavirus. Right? And this is what we are using now in powerful processors. This is the largely dominant to technology today that we can still scale up to maybe 2050 down to around one nanometer. So we can do more than computing with that. We can imagine photonic chips, spintronic devices, many other quantum computing in the future. So there is a huge paradigm change in computation today. I would like you, if you understand this figure and take a look at it, is tell you how computation is now distributed between the cloud, what you see in the center at the data center, the cloud, I call them big brains, amazing capacity of power. And on the outer circle, you have what is called Internet of Things node, tiny brains that still compute and do other function. And now they are all supported by the same silicon technology that you have seen just the slide before. But what we are working in research is to replace or to add something that is called quantum in the cloud and neuromorphic in the brain. So all these small Internet of Things node we try to take inspiration from nature, while in the cloud when we need something beyond what nature can compute, we are trying to exploit the quantum um, capacity uh, of technology. And from edge to cloud, outer circle to the center, will have AI. And this will be empowered by nanochips in the future. So let me tell you a few words about quantum computing. So in quantum computing, instead of encoding the information just binary in zero and one, we are using for encoding something that we call a qubit. The qubit, for instance, is the spin of an atom or electron or hole. So an electron has a spin up and a spin down. So this spin can be controlled electrically. And of course you can use polarization of a photon energy level in an ion. So what is so amazing with that is that now the information can be processed in a superposed state where the zero and one are superposed like the position on a sphere instead of pointing to the north and to the south. So in a single space and at a single moment of time, if I entangle n qubit, I can describe two power n solution of a problem. And what, you will say. Remember this history of the chess in which you are putting a grain of rice and then you are doubling all the time. Two power 300, if I put 300 qubits there, it's equivalent to all the atoms that we can detect today in the universe. Atoms, not stars. So in fact, we can parallelize and process information and we have a solution now that question is, you have to know how to pick the right solution among all the solution there. But Google showed that a computation that they have done on a problem of factorization in six seconds would take half a century. So these are things that we can now do. And what you see at the bottom is a qubit. You know, this five finger, you see three blue fingers and, and two yellow fingers. This is a qubit. The yellow finger under them, they create two quantum dots. One thing you just talk about quantum dot, when you couple the quantum dot, they form a qubit and you have an electron between them. And this is again produced by the same technology we produce the transistor, gated quantum nano dot in semiconductor. And I put you just a picture, it's a real picture of the coronavirus nearby. Look how the virus is looking compared to the device, right? We are doing device at the same scale with the viruses. And there are huge opportunity for that. So some of them positive, some of them that we can consider risk. Exponential speed up. If we combine AI with quantum computing, this can give you an amazing speed up that we cannot reach out of today. Enhance, enhance data security for quantum cryptography and quantum secure communication. You can have in the future optimization of system based on such a quantum enhancement in which you are looking at the space that you cannot access today of optimization. Training and inference, and people are talking of something that I cannot even imagine today they call quantum metaverse. 
Now, what are the risks? The risk is if you have such a powerful computation with quantum, of course, you can think differently. I can break maybe any encryption. I can imagine quantum attacks that we cannot imagine today, and I don't know how to answer maybe to some of them. Maybe we'll enable a level of intelligence beyond some people are again, again uh, criticizing, but again, it depends how you define intelligence, right? Um, and then this is why we have to address this with regulatory and policy changes. We, we have really to do, and usually I do not like a, a, a lot of regulatory uh, things because some people are thinking, and at least in research, that this can prevent a bit innovation. But in AI, I think the European Commission did the right thing to make some step further to do regulatory because there, are, there is an uncharted territory. And of course, other risk is a lack of equity in the way this will be developed and implemented. Rich versus poor, this is a technology that costs a lot in investment. Now, let me move uh, and try to catch back over the time because I'm a bit late, uh, about nanosensing and Internet of Things. So, I was talking about computation. What about sensing? Why sensing is so important? To understand why sensing is important, take a look at this picture in 2007 of Steve Jobs. What is the smartphone, the iPhone? Is the first wireless computer with sensor. So he had this amazingly simple idea to take a computer, to take a sensor. What is the sensor? The camera, right? and put a wireless connection of, of the phone. And this created a new type of ecosystem that can be used by anyone without any technical training, right? And this creating an amazing domain of application that we have not imagined before he put these three things together. And what will happen in the future? Maybe you will have this system deployed in tens of billion of the outer circle in this internet of things and edge of the cloud. You see this outer circle there. If you look at it, you will find that, and let me move a bit. Okay, then I can show you this picture. So imagine how you make autonomous system that have this function and we can use them as healthy manager in your hands. We can use it as smarter companion that can tell you what hazard is in your environment, the quality of your air and water. We can do disaster management with robots that are equipped with this sensor. Of course, you can do also management of a battlefield if you want with it, right? This we have to say today. You can have smart drive assistant, you have, have stress assistant, you can monitor the environment, and you can use the information that you measure with this in order to manage better a city's transportation uh, resource distribution. So, technology is going to give us something that is predictive power. We already have predicted power, for instance, in weather prediction. Why do you think the weather can be predicted within five days so accurately, right? Be apart microclimate region, because we combine satellite data with ground sensor data, with ocean level sensor data, temperature, pressure, wind speed. And this we put it in big model that we run an extremely powerful computer and you can predict the trajectory of a, of a storm like it was Irma. Now, the question is, can we benefit tomorrow by predicting, for instance, your health? Having something that will let predict instead of having a chronic level of a disease or even something worse. And this is what we can do by using bio nano sensor for P3 healthcare. P3 is really uh, personalized, preventive and participatory. Participatory means People are putting together their data. And today, with nanosensor, we enable wearable technology. Sensor as tiny as you can put them under your skin and measure different type of analytes. Um, you have maybe saw the sensor that you put on your upper arm to measure continuously glucose that is now commercialized, but we will be able to do in the future the same by monitoring. And you see here such a um, monitoring system in the middle that is now in research by a Swiss company in which they want to monitor lactate and protein, tools that you don't have yet in the hospital. You don't want to wait hours to have a lab analysis back. You will have it on the spot in a few minutes. And you can study adverse effect of, of um, 
of different drugs, you know, adverse effect and medical error. This is the third cause of death after uh, on, on Earth after cancer and uh, cardiovascular. So we can reduce medical error. So up to 80% of the cost in healthcare associated to non-communicable diseases are preventable. And nanotech can contribute to this. And I, I will let you read all these advantages that you may have there. So we have now sensors as tiny as they can be put on a stamp. What you see here from John Rogers group on the right, a sensor that are on an electronic stamp that you put on your skin for 24 hours and you monitor a certain signal and then you wash it out. Now, what can we do with this type of amount of data that we generate for this sensor? Not only measure simply and monitor things on us and in the environment. We can build something that is amazingly unique for the future, is digital twins of all the objects. So a digital twin is a model that is calibrated on the reality that will let you not only to simulate the functional aspect of an object, of a process, of a system of system, but it will let you to predict, if you take an action on it, how it will behave. The first digital twin concept ever was implemented in the NASA Apollo 13 program when they have to save the crew of Apollo 13. They simulated on Earth all the scenario in the reality, and then they put it on Apollo 13 to bring the astronaut back to Earth. But now we have the power of computer to do the simulation. And now, for instance, first use of this were really to design and build system of system like the F-35, 200,000 parts that are electronic, mechanical, thermal management, more than 3,000 integrated circuit, and more than 20 million lines of code. You have to simulate and validate this. But we can do better. We can take these things that was validated on an aircraft and imagine doing digital twin first to have linear factories. Siemens is implemented digital twins of processes of product, more efficient processes. You know how to take action in case something is happening in, in, in a factory, a problem, how to manage better the resources, have less waste of resources. You can have digital twin of cities like Singapore is implemented with Dassault. What's digital twin to manage a country? if of course you have this digital data uh, among what are the processes and the resources of the country and how they are managed. And lastly, not least, digital twin of human to manage the healthcare. And this is something that we expect to have a lot of advantages in the future. So what is finally the basis of digital twin is to understand and quantify and then predict and change scenario in management uh, based on this prediction. I think there is an excellent convergence with this and what UN define as sustainability goals, right? UN has defined 17 sustainability goals to my knowledge. Each of them can be addressed with such a technology, digital twin enabled by nanotech and AI. So intervention and transformative change can be evaluated in all the field of economy and society across the life cycle of processes, system, and organization. So nanotechnology, Internet of Things, AI, digital twin, I think they offer more hope than related security threats. But we have to accept there are security threats related to the data, to the use, to the way this will impact our society. And indeed, some people are very worried about this because you may have something that never happened in the past, combinatorial effect of nanotech with AI, with cognitive system, with Internet of Things data. And then you see here different scenarios, some positive, some negative, and people are worried about the risk of, when you have many exponential technology, you may have the risk of what is called singularity. And this is what we have to see. How an uncontrolled singularity they may result is managed versus exponential societal benefit. And I will end my talk with um, a list of possible critical action in what could be called nanotech diplomacy. And you are all around this table, more specialist into that than myself. And I believe we have to address in the future a few points. First, we need to put together, and I said, together means the UN states, 
a vision for the responsible development and application of nanotech under ethical consideration, right? We have to be very careful when this is used in human enhancement, when this is used in surveillance, when this is used in military. Let's try to have a reflection there and a vision. A fair and inclusive distribution because this can disturb even more the unfair distribution of today. We have to identify as early as possible any security risk. And I think this can be done if you establish international standards and regulation without jeopardizing the innovation. And this is because there is always a dual use in any domain of science and technology. And last, maybe something that it can be called, and I saw in some of the documents of UN, that collaborative diplomacy is a crucial to unlock the full potential of nanotechnology. And this is again to preserve global innovation and planetary benefits. And uh, with, with that, I, I finish my uh, presentation. I thank you very much for the attention. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Oh, thank you so much, Professor, uh, for the presentation. I find it like super fascinating and informative. I especially like the notion of nanotech diplomacy. I have a couple of follow-up questions. Then I will uh, like we can open the floor for the Q and A session. So uh, my first question concerns the projected development in nanoelectronics. So um, let's say in the coming three to five years, what are some of the anticipated development uh, for the field? of nanotechnology and nanoelectronics, especially, um, you know, what are the key challenges our scientists and engineers are seeking to address? Um, of course, I, I can give you just, um, it's okay, can you hear me? Um, more personal opinion on that. So what we see now as driving force is the huge demand uh, of AI for more powerful chips and, um, because um, many companies uh, for this use are ready to pay the price, uh, you have seen now, and I can tell you there is a demand uh, that is at the growth that it's up to 5x higher in, in the AI chips compared to other type of chips. So chips for AI in the cloud, but also not, in, not only in the cloud, maybe chips that will be used in autonomous system on the edge. So th this is one clear direction that I see. So, uh, and uh, this is going to be addressed by traditional technology, pushing CMOS down to the very end. And uh, then looking at this alternative that I talk about the, the, the quantum and maybe neuromorphic as well at the edge, because in these cases you, you may need a neuromorphic system. Um, so that, that's an interesting point. Another one could be related to massive demands of um, new generation of, of sensor, because I, I mentioned you this aspect of digital twin. If you want to deploy in the future digital twin, you will need what is called data generators. This needs all kinds of sensor to be developed and deployed. And uh, depending on the scenario, you have different families of sensor that will be integrated with systems. So, the computing system will, will take another dimension. I mean, even if we compare to a human, a human in the first year, what does it mean becoming intelligent? You have a lot of information that is coming through your perception system, and then you form different circuit in the brain and you, be, you have different behavior. So we may have system that will learn how to do better in the future because they will uh, be provided with this type of sensory interfaces. So sensory interfaces is, the, is the, the second important thing that will happen. And certainly both that I mentioned will be clearly enabled by, by nanotech. And, and third point I want to mention, there is a certain worry uh, about the fact that everything has to be much more energy efficient. So this is a driving force today. You mentioned it, um, I would think. Um, in fact, look at current data center. In, in data center, when you have these big, big brains, today roughly they consume kind of around 4% in average of the energy of a country. In Switzerland is 4%, US is similar. There is one country that is, much, is more than 20%, which is Ireland. And there is because they have a lot of data center, right? They put a lot on the territory. So 
you have to think in the future if you are going to to ask much more ai and much more powerful data center then everything should be much more energy efficient if i want to deploy trillion devices at the edge everything should be energy efficient so energy efficiency is the third challenge that we have to address